listen, very important. When words are coming through to you, how do we take it in? Because that's where this attitude thing is going to come and show itself right now. It says, anytime we feel we are not learning anything from a sermon or a Bible teacher, we should check our attitude. So whenever we're in church and we're sitting in that congregation and the pastor is preaching and preaching and preaching and we're not getting any word, we should look at our attitude. Because now he's telling us, how do we listen? Especially, we should check our attitude, especially for pride. Pride is one of the biggest things that stop people from taking on information. I don't want to hear it. This is because God can speak through even the most boring teacher when we are humble and receptive. So no matter how boring that person is, telling you something. God can speak through that person. Remember God talks, God interacts with us through people. He's not coming down physically to talk to us. Me sitting down here and reading all this to you, if he's touching you, that's God using me to talk to you. So it's for you to be in a receptive mood, ready to take on this seed. Like the, this, the, the seed that fell in the fertile ground. It was receptive. Either you then, or you become the, the other three that Jesus uncovered, which is the shallow ground, which is the hard soil, which is the soil with weeds. And he, he explained it. The, shallow, the hard soil is a closed mind. This person doesn't want to hear a thing you're talking about. You can talk from now till you drop. Not one word is going to drop in. The shallow soil is a superficial mind. This mind, <laughs> oh yeah, okay, keep talking. Uh, I may be hearing, but I'm not. Okay, whatever, when you finish, it's done. And the soil with weeds is a distracted mind. You're saying everything, yes, is, is nodding and it's not arguing with you. But his mind is not there, it's somewhere else. And this was a huge one for me because this applies to everyday life. When we read a book, Bob Proctor, one of the men I listened to, he said he, lis he reads that um, uh, Think and Grow Rich every day. He takes it everywhere with him. And why does he read it? Because every time he reads it, he gets a new message. That's what it is. He gets a new message. So it depends on what state of mind he was in when he read it at one point the first time or the second time and so the message is changing based on his mood Saint Paramore explains um, our receptiveness to information to knowledge to skills that bear fruits in our lives Whenever I watch a movie, I watch it, a movie I like, I watch it several times. Because each time I watch it, I pick up something new. Each time I watch it, I pick up something new. That's because at that point in time, my state of mind is changing. And so is picking something new out of that message. When we, you know, most times for us was when we argue with our husbands, you find that he's probably not hearing one word you're saying. Because maybe at that stage, he's in that shallow mind. And the same thing could also happen to the wife. She's not taking any of this because she's got the mind closed. Same thing with children. You may be talking to your child, they're not hearing one word you're saying. They're standing there physically, but they have not heard one word. Their mind at that stage They've decided what state they want to put it in. Family members, your friends, your teachers. It is your receptive attitude that picks up the messages. It's the state you have put your mind in that picks up that message. And, and sometimes you then ask yourself, what did that mean? When they said this, what did that mean? Your receptiveness. 
And I tell you, that really touched me as well in my training here, which again, we have our home training DVD pack here, where everything you need to know about natural hair care and extensions is in here. 30 DVDs covering every topic. And we get people come here for training, and you occasionally get the one who come here with their mind already set in their head how it should be, and then when you start training them, they are not taking in anything. And I, I remember I used to query myself, wondering where did I, what did I do wrong? What did I not, what, what did I not try to show this person that I showed the other person? And it turns out this book is right telling me now bluntly, it depends on their receptiveness. Because I've had students who have turned out amazing. And then I've had the ones, there was one who actually finished and put her training head and everything about the course in the loft. And then it hit her one day that, oh my goodness, I really should be doing this. And then she calls me and says, yes, you've been in training here before. And she goes, do you know I actually put the head in the loft? How does that help me help her? And I usually say to people, if you know you're not ready, don't, don't, don't even waste your time and my time. I mean, from this book, we've realized how much time means to us. Time that we've lost is gone. We can't get it back. So your receptiveness di dictates what you take into your thoughts. It's your receptiveness that counts. And so I remember I read somewhere on Facebook where somebody was write, writing that he learned that when people have a problem with you, it is not really with you. It is with themselves. And that touched me too. Because somebody may have a problem with you and you're wondering, what did I do wrong? It's because they cannot cope with you. So the issue is them, not you. Just like the lady I was having this conversation with on YouTube, I'm wearing a blonde wig and she's having problem with that. How did that become me? She is the one who's struggling with her culture to wonder why me, black woman, should be wearing blonde wig because as far as she knows, culture in her head says don't wear blonde wig. So do you see how you become the problem and not the people that you actually have problems with? Because it's your state of mind. It's the way you've allowed yourself to receive that person. You rub them the wrong way. There is nothing you can do about that. This is why when people don't like you, you don't go changing yourself. Because most people, most insecure people, the minute somebody said something to them, they're thinking, how can I go about changing me now so I can please that person? Now, this is one thing you must learn. You are who you are. You've been made that way. That's what this book is reminding us. The personalities that we are, God has created it that way because he loves variety. And that's why you go into the garden and you see so many colors of flowers. You go into the forest and you see so many types of animals. We're not all meant to be uniform. We're not meant to be one. And that's why it's a uniform, a unity, not uniformity. And so it is about themselves to, to either cope with you or they face themselves. They have to deal with themselves because you're not asking them to change for you. So why should you change for them? I get this so much on social media. And on our YouTube, we've got over 20, about 20 million views. So if I'm changing myself each time to suit each person that watches, would I turn into 20 million character? That's what you need to ask yourself. And so this is such a big message for all of us. God gave each of us a personality. Let us learn to be receptive enough to accept each other or at least respect each other. The problem is your attitude towards me. My attitude towards you is simply love. And that's my role here, to love. Remember what it says, it says, love God, love people. As you love yourself. And so I'm open to train people. So you come here, I'm open to train you. 
if you're struggling to pick up what I'm trying to share with you, you have to change your attitude towards me. Because my attitude is, I am happy to train you. You've paid your money, you're here with me. My job is to give you the skill you came for. Your attitude is struggling to open up and receive the message. So it's about you, not about me. And so, I'm happy to train you. I'm happy to support you. I'm happy to advise you. I'm happy to share with you. It is you that have to change your unreceptive attitude to accept me. And the same happens to everyone. It's you, not them. And so, James advises, in a humble and gentle, modest way, Spirit receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your spirit, in your heart. It contains the power to save our souls. And in, in the Lion King, the the, what the Lion King said was, the teacher is waiting when the student is ready. The teacher is always waiting whenever the student is ready. So that receptiveness is where the issue is. And there was a little example, my daughter, she, she does not like hair, it's not her thing. She's always said to me, mom, I don't like to work with hair, just leave hair out of it, I don't wanna deal with hair. And then what happened recently? She saw a hairstyle that she loved and she got herself, she sat on her own, yes, she can do her basic cornrow on herself. She's been doing that. And so she got this hairstyle, a crochet hairstyle. And then she came to me and said, can you show me how to put this in? And I showed it to her. And she did it. And she was so happy with herself. And she's saying to me now, oh, I can't believe I could do it. And I said, I'm always here to teach you whenever you're ready. So that just explains to you what we're saying. She was not receptive all these years, not interested, didn't want to know. And then now that she wanted to do it, I just showed her once and she got it. So that's what happens to your receptiveness. When you're ready to do something, the teacher is ready. Whenever the student is ready, the teacher has always been there waiting for you. So he goes on to tell us, for most of the 2000 years, history of the church only the priests got to personally read the bible 2000 years ago only the priests had to read the bible but now billions of us have access to it i have so many bibles everywhere i go i put one in spite of this many of us are faithful to reading the newspaper to listening to the news than reading the bible Time to think. We rather read the newspaper every day. I know people who will do that. They don't mind how much it costs, they will buy it. I know people who sit by the news day and day and they want to hear what's happening. But the one thing you will not see people think of reading is the Bible. That's a big question for all of us. It is no wonder we don't grow spiritually. So obviously because we don't read what we should be reading, there's no growth, we're stunted. We are anorexic in spirit. The Bible is always waiting for us whenever we are ready. Because it's always there. Remember there are billions of Bible out there. We can't watch television for three hours. In some places, a whole day. There are people, they call them couch potatoes, and they just sit on the couch, and then they are staring at TV. Every program that passes, they are watching. Continuously. Then, when we have the few seconds to spare, three minutes, you then look at the Bible. And oh my goodness, I read the Bible today for three minutes. But we've been watching TV all day, it did not matter. So God is always waiting. So no, what he was asking is, so if we carry on like that, where is, where is any sign of us growing spiritual? There is none. God is always waiting for us whenever we are happy to change our attitude towards him. Because remember the unreceptive attitude? 
So we are extremely unreceptive to the Bible, but we are receptive to watching TV, listening to news, buying newspaper, buying whatever, we buy other books we read, but we're not ready to look at the Bible. And our spiritual growth will continue to be stunted if this is how we want to go about it. Some people, they just go to church for that one hour, two hours. That's the whole week done. No more. So, a thought came to my head too while I was reading this. Our mind is like a sponge. And so, it soaks everything we expose it to. Also like a fertile land, like the parable of the sower said. It will grow any seed that you put inside it. So, with emotion, any message we allow our mind to be exposed to will come in. That's the receptiveness we're talking about. And so we have this mind that is very uh, uh, um, gullible. It will take on anything that it sees as long as we are receptive to it. So therefore we need to be careful what we expose our mind to. What we allow our children to expose their mind to. Because it festers and eventually whatever that thing is will come to reality. And we could, on the other hand, use this advantage of the mind being this sucking machine to give it the right thing, being the Bible. Because we know that the words from the Bible is light. It gives us hope. It gives us direction. So why then are we rather feeding our minds with the wrong things? We are what we think about. So think about it, expose your mind to it, feed it with information and knowledge that is good, and it will become your reality. you get something good out of life. Again, these are all the ways we're looking at changing our life and having this new amazing life. Make a commitment today to change the way you have been looking at things. We're trying to create a new life. It starts with a commitment. Many of us, who claim to believe the Bible from cover to cover, have never read it from cover to cover. Yes, we say, yeah, we love the Bible, but we've not really read it from cover to cover. However, if we commit to read the Bible for 15 minutes a day, we will read completely through it once in a year. If we commit now and say, yes, after hearing this information now, oh my goodness, I've been doing the wrong thing, Lord, forgive me. Let me take on your word. Let me commit to you. Let me give you a receptive mind. And we start doing 15 minutes of reading Bible each day. He says we can finish the Bible in a year. Although I'm thinking this will depend on how quick or how slow this reader is. But that's not the important thing. I'll tell you, there are Bibles that help us in that direction. Like this one that I have. That was one of the reasons I bought it. They've given us what they call the reading plans. And so it tells you how much you can read in six months, how much you can read in one year, and how much you can read in two years. So it, it depends on the, on the commitment you decide to give it. What, which one do you want to go for? Every word of the Bible, it says three years. So again, that's commitment. But he's saying that if you read 15 minutes every day, you can finish it in one year. This one's given you chapters that says if you want to read every word, you can finish it in one year, um, sorry, in three years. And then he has another one that you can read in six months. And that's the one I chose when I started reading my Bible. I was speaking because it gives you verses and chapters and you know the ones to read that get straight to the message so that's a commitment you could decide to do that because while we want to grow spiritually we don't want to be spiritually anorexic again and start getting started from what is good for our spirit if we cut a one 30 minute television program a day and read the bible instead we may read the Bible twice a year, going with the 15 minute option he's given us. So if we take away 30 minutes of sitting and staring at that TV, or maybe in the case of young people stuck on their iPhone or Samsung or whatever, young people, that's all they look at. If we take out just 30 minutes from doing that and use that 30 minutes instead in reading the Bible, 
we will get more out of life. We'll be spiritually alive. And so, the benefits, it says, is daily Bible reading will keep us in range of God's voice and word. Remember, we're focusing. We're trying to hear God's word here. This is why God instructed the kings of Israel to keep a copy of his word nearby. He instructed the kings. These are kings. You must have a Bible near you. And I know in the, in the States, I, I know um, all the presidents talk about the Bible. Yes, they're holding the Bible. That's where he's coming from. We may hold the Bible, but do we read it from cover to cover? Makes you wonder. He should keep it with him all the time and read and read from it every day of his life. The kings of Israel were told that they should keep the Bible and read it every day of their life. Don't just keep it near you, read it regularly. A simple helpful tool is the daily Bible reading plan. And so in this particular book, he has what he calls his daily Bible reading plan. Um, I actually looked at it. It's at the end of the of the book, and he gives us a website to go to, and uh, we can order it. They will send it to you free. So we'll do that when we get to the end. So it prevents you from skipping around the Bible arbitrarily and overlooking sections. So naturally, if you are not given any guide, then you may just oh flip through. Oh, today I feel like reading this. Flip through again, another one. And then you're overlooking important sections. So we will check these options when we're done. So thirdly, researching and studying the Bible is another practical way to abide in the world. And the difference between reading and studying the Bible involves two additional activities. And one is asking questions of the text and writing down your insights. So that was me writing down my insights here. I started doing this long before I took up this book. So I was on the right track after all. And that's why I was saying to you earlier that that's my book inside it. And what I did with this book is every time I read anything, I was always scribbling them down and scribbling them down and noting things out of it. So I was on the right track. So he's saying whatever we're reading, we shouldn't just read. We should scribble that in, um, insights and not things. You haven't really studied the Bible unless you've written down your thoughts on paper or on computer, wherever you normally like to write your stuff. So the secret of good Bible studying is learning to ask the right questions. Different methods use different questions. So you will discover for far more if you pause and ask simple questions as who, what, when, where, why and how. Bible says truly happy people are those who carefully study God's perfect law that makes people free and they continue to study it. So these are what creates happy people. You read the Bible, you study it, you take it on and you leave it. You are happy. They do not forget what they heard, but they obey what God's teaching says. Those who do this will be made happy. And the fourth way to abide in God's word is by remembering it. So your capacity to remember is a God-given God gift. You may think you have a poor memory. Lots of us think that. But the truth is you have millions of ideas, truths, facts, and figures memorized. You can do that. You can always think of things and remember them. So why don't you tell yourself, I have poor memory? You remember what is important to you. And that's the secret. It makes me laugh like young children. You tell them to do something, they happily forget. My kids, they happily forget when you ask them to do anything. But the minute is what they want. They will never forget that thing, never. Like my daughter, whenever she has to go on a birthday party with her friends, she would have been up like 5 a.m. getting ready. But if you had asked her, please, could you pick my clothes up or could you sweep the floor? Could... I forgot. So he's telling us here that when it's something that's important to us, we remember. 
And so that thing we're hiding under her poor memory is not a truth. We're just telling tales. If God's word is important, you will take the time to remember it. That's the message. And so there are enormous benefits to memory, to memorizing the Bible verses. And so it will help you resist temptation. And so obviously, remember we said earlier, when Jesus was being tempted and he said to uh, the devil, get it behind me, Satan. Now, if you find that some thoughts are coming into your head and trying to push you in the wrong direction, you could just pick up that verse. Get it behind me, Satan. You do that and it goes. It will help you resist temptation. It will, make it will help you make wise decisions. It will help you reduce stress. It will help you build confidence. It will help you offer good advice. It will help you share your faith with others. So again, reduce stress is also very important. Because sometimes when you're so stressed and you pick up something, like vanity upon vanity, sometimes I'm stressed and things are just way, and I just remind myself, vanity upon vanity. Then I remember, I realize, okay, all of this is getting nowhere. Why am I killing myself over it? Oh, oh yeah, we're only here for a certain number of years. What's, why, why, why do I have to give myself so much hassle over something that is only going to be here anyway? So when we do that, when we remember verses, all these things happen because remember they are alive. They are alive because this is what will guide your thoughts. Our memory is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it will become. And memorizing scriptures will become easier too. Because our memory is like a muscle, it's like a part of us. The more you use it, the better it becomes. This is like every skill in our life too. So the skill of memorizing things is like every skill in our life too. Where even with, with, um, with uh, uh, the skill of braiding, which we offer here. You get people who come for training and they're struggling and I say, don't stress yourself. Just take your time, do it, and keep doing it, and keep doing it. The more you do it, the better it gets. And that's what he's telling us here. Just the same thing with the skill of memorizing things. The more you remind yourself, remember this, remember, the better you get. So he says, we begin by selecting a few Bible verses that have touched us and write them down on a small card to carry along with us. Then review them aloud throughout the day. So that's what I did here when I started writing my verses here. It goes, this book goes with me everywhere. And so whenever I find that something is trying to make sense to me, ah, I just go in there and I pick it out. And so we can memorize the scripture anywhere, while walking or exercising, while driving, waiting, or at bedtime. Tell ourselves, you quote, you quote, you quote, you're relaxed. Stress goes. And so the three keys of memorizing are review, review, and review. Just keep reviewing it. Just like practice, practice, practice. Bible says, remember what Christ taught and let his words enrich your lives and make you wise. We should remember what Christ taught us. Let the words enrich us. Let the words make us wise. The fifth way to abide in God's word is to reflect on it, which the Bible calls meditation. For many, the idea of meditating brings up images of putting our mind in neutral and letting it wonder. I, I, remember, I remember thinking that way too because um, most times when somebody says to you, sit still and don't say anything. Just sit still. Boom. You see your mind going crazy. It's like it's on fire. It's like they've, said, they've just said to the mind, can you travel around the world and find what's here and what's there? And so he says, that's not what meditation is. This is the exact opposite of biblical meditation. He said meditation is focused thinking. Just put your mind on one thought. It takes serious effort. You select a verse and you reflect on it over and over and over in your mind. Vanity upon vanity. Vanity upon vanity. Vanity upon vanity. And so if you keep doing that over and over and over, you find that, as explained in previous chapters, if you know how to worry, you already know how to meditate. 
What is worry? Worry is when you're thinking about one thing over and over and over, and I know some. <laughs> I haven't got any money. Oh my goodness. I haven't got any money. Oh dear. I haven't got any money. And so when you keep doing that over and over and over, then your whole body takes it. And then you start getting down and getting, you know, you start become, becoming sad and sad and sad. And before you know it, your whole body has taken that on. And that's why I say to most people, mind over matter. So if you have a little cut in your hand like the kids, oh God, cut in my hand and it hurts so much and it hurts so much. And I say, take your mind off it. Can you just think of something else? The minute you do that, you forget that you had a cut in your hand. And that's worry. And so it wants us to focus on our, our thoughts. The same way we focus our thoughts on worry, focus our thoughts on a verse in the Bible. Pick up a verse and tell yourself that whole day, vanity of vanity. For example, um, God is the truth. Uh, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was, was with God. The word was God. And so I remind myself that the whole day. That's meditation. Worry is focused thinking on something negative, something that's not healthy. That's all you're thinking about. Now he wants us to transpose that. Think instead of something positive. Meditation is doing the same thing, only focus on God's word instead of your problem. Instead of worrying about that problem, focus on what God has said to you. No other habit can do more to transform your life and make you more like Jesus than daily reflection on scriptures. As we take the time to contemplate God's truth, seriously reflecting on the example of Christ, we are transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory if you look up at the times god speaks about meditation in the bible we will be amazed at the benefits he has promised to those who take time to meditate on his word throughout the day and one of the reasons god called david a man after my own heart is that david loved to reflect on god's words he said how i love your teaching I think about them all day long. Remember, our thoughts create our actions, which creates our life's direction. We wondered in the last chapter where we can source information from that will influence our thinking. Now we found it, just reflecting on God's words. That's what feeds our thoughts. And King Solomon said it all. In all things, seek understanding. So we are seeking understanding from the Bible. We should seek knowledge. And the Bible is therefore our source for inspiration in our thoughts. If we think about them all day long, then the answer will come and we act accordingly. So you see how the answer has come to us? Think and grow rich. We're thinking in God's words. Then we're going to be rich. Obviously, spiritually starting with and then we'll find our, our reason for being here. How awesome is that? It is not only when we have gone to university to get doctorate or professional degrees that we become wise. We don't need that. Because I know we've been told over and over that even people who are professors, some, some of them are still working in McDonald's. Why? Because we're not thinking clearly. We think it's academic education that's been wise. No. And I was reading something on Facebook the, the last last time, and somebody was writing about this issue in Nigeria. The last president we had was a doctor, Dr. Jonathan. And he presided over this country as his reign became the worst time of looting in Nigeria. The worst time of people becoming completely reckless with the treasury money. People Wrapping the country out of its natural world. And this was a, a doctor, doctor, academic education. And one of the words these people were writing was, most people voted for him because they thought, oh yeah, at least he's educated. He would think right. But he obviously didn't. And all the other ones who have maybe managed or done something a bit okay, None of them got up to that level of education. 
So is it education that makes us wise? No. It's just reading what somebody has written and passing exams. That's what it is. It doesn't bring wiseness. And so serious reflection or meditation on God's truth is a key to answered prayers and the secret to successful living. So if you want to live successfully, which is the dream we're having by reading this book, we want to focus on God's word. And it's reminding us we must apply its principles. So receiving, reading, researching, remembering, and reflecting. I call it the five R's. All these things on the word of God are all useless if we fail to put them into practice. So if we if we just receive and read and research and remember and reflect on the word and we don't do anything with it, we don't put it into practice, it's absolutely useless. We must become doers of the word. We must do, we must act the word. This is the hardest part or the hardest step of all because the devil's fight, this devil, he fights this part so intensely. Remember the, word, the, the, the voices in our head? One is saying, you know, whisper nice things. Another one is telling you loud, bold things. You know, don't do that. Don't listen to that person. Don't go there. What about what? You know, that's the devil. He invades our spirit just as the Holy Spirit is in our spirit. So it's for us to be able to know the difference. And whenever you hear people say, "By devil, devil," you think, "Oh yeah, devil is gonna come down on earth and stand in your face and tell you what to do." And go, oh, "Yeah, I resist you, devil." It's inside you. Remember when Judas. You know, handed Jesus over to the people that were coming to kill him. It was the devil that used him. In the end, what did Judas do? He returned the money. When he realized that, uh oh, what have I done? He realized it was blood money. And apparently, uh, the last time I was in church and the pastor was preaching this, that money was used to buy a piece of land and they called the land blood land, something like that. And then Judas went and committed suicide. He went and hung himself. That's how the devil can use us if we're not strong enough to know the difference. So this is the hardest part or the hardest step of all because the, devil's, the devil fights it so intensely. He doesn't mind you going to Bible studies as long as you don't do anything with it, with what you've learned. We fool ourselves by assuming that just because we have heard, we have read, we have studied a truth, we have internalized that truth. We can be so busy going to the next class, the next conference, or the next seminar that we have no time to implement everything we've learned. And one of the biggest things we've learned so far, we should love God and we should love others. To me, and I know the book says, I know the Bible says, is the first commandment we should take on. Love ourselves, love, I mean, love other people like we love ourselves. Because the minute you do that, then doing bad things to people disappears from your mind. Hating people disappears from your mind. Being jealous of people goes away. And then you have people like, you know, I, I call them the cowboy pastors out there in Nigeria in particular and Africa. They just want to destroy the lowly person. They want to take every penny they've got so that they can amass so much. And when you do that, you're not doing what God has asked you to do. You're not a doer. You're just a theologist. You're an ideologist. You read, and oh wow, I read. You haven't internalized it. You haven't put it into action. And so we forget all these things on our way to the next class or the next studies. So without implementation or action, all our Bible studies, doctrines, and preachings and uh, preaches are worthless. So that's what's happening in all these churches that are so destroying the Christian faith. Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and put them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So again, that's like the seed that was trapped in the fertile ground. And so it grows, 
great roots and, and brings out amazing fruits. So enough with the doctrines. Jesus also pointed out that God's blessing comes from obeying the truth, not just knowing it. Are we acting on it? Remember the word is what becomes our thoughts. He said, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Another reason we avoid personal application is that it can be difficult or even painful. Lots of us struggle to act on these things. The truth will set us free, but first it may make us miserable. So yes, whenever you're dealing with the truth, which never changes, it might make us miserable, but it's never, it never changes. And one thing the truth does is it sets you free. Because if you have to tell that truth all the time, you don't have to think about it. It's the truth. You don't have to say, oh yeah, I think I just remembered something. And then so and so happened. That's not the truth. The truth never changes. And so it sets us free. God's words exposes our motives. He points out our faults. He rebukes our sins. And he expects us to change. So whenever we look at God's words, he takes us straight to the point. He wants us to do something about it. It is human nature to resist change. So applying God's word is hard work. As humans, we really don't like anything that doesn't work well with us. We struggle with anything that inf in involves change. It is therefore helpful if we share and discuss our personal application with other people. So he's suggesting here that if we, once we start taking on these passages and we are thinking of acting on them, we should create groups and share with our friends what we want to do. Because when you do that, it is important we become part of a group so we can learn from each other's truth, as we will never learn on our own. Remember that I talk about isolation. So when you sit in isolation and you tell yourself you're holy, say you're deceiving yourself. Because who are you, who are you, compete, who are you competing with? Who are you, maybe not compete, but who are you struggling with? Who is giving you something that you have to respond to in the sense of, okay, this person is different from me, and so I have to receive this person, I have to respect this person, I have to accommodate this person. That's the real challenge of God. Remember, he says, life is a test. And so you haven't been through life if you haven't been tested. That's what it is. And whichever way you look at it, you are going to get a test. As long as you're human, you will have a test. That's just the way life is. And so you cannot handle that test in isolation. Other people help us see things and insights that we will never have seen on our own. Another great way of becoming a doer of the word is to always write out an action step as a result of our reading or studying or reflecting on God's word. So he says we should develop the habit of writing down exactly what we intend to do. So he's reminding us to plan, plan, plan every part of our life. And this is true. It affects everything we do in life. It's like whenever you're thinking of the next move to make in your life and you start documenting them, you start writing them down, you find that you act on it. But if they just become thoughts in your head and they end there and you're not putting it into action, nothing happens. This action should be personal, involving you, practical, something you can do, and provable with a deadline to it. So when you start writing these things, try and put it down and make it as practical as possible. Make it as doable as possible because you have a deadline on it. Just like we chose to do this 40-day program. So there is a program in place. It, it is practical. It has a deadline. We have taken it on. Every application we involve will involve either your relationship to God, meaning you must love God, whatever you're taking on, your relationship to other people, meaning you have to love other people, or your personal character, meaning your attitude, how are you taking on this thing, how receptive are you to handle whatever this idea is. Do you have a closed receptiveness? Do you have an open receptiveness? Do you have a shallow receptiveness? So all these things add up. Take time to think about this question. 
what has God already told you to do in his word that you haven't started doing yet? So now he's asking us a question. In that small, still voice telling you do something, you know it's God speaking to you, but you haven't done it. What is that thing? And for me, walking with you on this book, it's a voice that came to me. And I took it on. And one of the big things I'm really looking at now, reading all this and understanding that there's a lot of misunderstanding out there, is mental slavery. There's a lot going on among us. Lots of us are lost. Because look at where we are. We're looking at our culture, we're looking at our a tradition we're looking at our emotions we're looking at our feelings all of these are not going to help us at all so we need to be released from these things so he wants us to write down a few action statements that will help us to act on it and you can tell a friend to help you hold you to accountability so if you have a friend please i want to start doing this could you help me if i if you ask me if i've done it and i say i haven't aha Remind me that I have to do it. And so you need to take that on. I want you to take that on. Maybe by the next time we meet, I want you to tell me some actions that you've taken. It would be nice. Or maybe on YouTube, please write me. Just tell me some of the actions you've decided to take on that you know is going to benefit your life, is going to benefit other people, is going to benefit God. It's going to bring something new to God. Like me taking on this, I've been able to share with you some of the ideas that are coming from the Bible, coming from somebody else who's, he is a pastor, Rick Warren. He has an amazing church. And then some of the things that will help change your life. So this whole thing I've taken on has helped me. So I am involved, you are involved, and God is involved. So that's the kind of thing he's saying, we need to take on things that will involve all of us. And so we're going to slowly end this chapter as D.L. Moody said, he quotes somebody, D.L. Moody, the Bible was not given to increase our knowledge. So we reading the Bible is not to increase our knowledge. It was given to us to change our life. Now that's clearly understanding that most of us don't read Bible. Most of us don't. And we're sitting down there crying in darkness because again, like I, I think it was the last chapter I was saying that lack of understanding is like you're in a dark room, groping. You don't know where to go. Where is the door? How do I get out? That's what lack of understanding brings. And that's why Solomon said, above all things, seek knowledge. So whatever it is you want to go into in life, first thing you do is seek knowledge. Like I put together all of this to help whoever's thinking of going into hair. Now, interestingly, especially regarding hair, I was watching, um, I received an email and he was telling me, I don't know if it's Ohio State or one of those states in the US, and they were going into detail to explain how these people are really struggling to gain the skill of braiding. And they all end up going to cosmetology colleges, which does not teach braiding in any form. And the number of hours braiders have been given to go and learn is so much more than even security officers. And yet when they take on these trainings, they are looking at $20,000 to pay for it. That was a huge eye-opener for me. Because this whole package that concentrates on teaching you everything there is to know, 30 DVDs with over 21 skills. And people are still struggling to handle it. So where is the hope? Where is the hope? So it's about seeking understanding in whatever you're doing. Once you get to understand what you're doing, the door opens, the light comes in. Remember when God said in Genesis, let there be light. That's what understanding means. The minute you have understanding, you have light. And it's the same thing about us living our life too. Because most of us living life, that's why we're so sad. That's why people are committing suicide. That's why there's so much depression. Because we don't seek knowledge. We just think we are going to, yeah, remember, I think it was in last chapter where he says some of us just roll around in life leading nowhere. Because we have no direction. 
So taking on this book to chat with you is a huge thing to help us find that direction that we lack. And so before we finish, we'll read our usual question. And question was, what has God already told me in his word? That was what he just asked us earlier. That I haven't started doing. So that's the question. So you ask yourself, what do I need to do? What can I do that will touch me, touch other people, and touch God? Start doing them. Because you never know. That might just be the thing that will change everything for you. And then the meditation was, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciple? So as long as God has given us words, he says he wants to use those words to, to kind of make us look or act like Jesus Christ. Because it's only the word that plants a seed in our mind. Indeed, um, um, you become my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The truth always sets everybody free. And so I picked up one of the ones that I was saying earlier was, in the beginning was the word. Remember, all of today was mostly focusing on the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. God is the word, and God is the truth. So I'm so happy we finished today again. Thank you so much for watching this, and thank you for all our commitment in making this happen. I look forward to seeing you in the next chapter. And God bless you abundantly.